بیانیه وضعیت پزشکی در کمپش رفت پروفسور لورد ترنبرگ عضو مجلس اعیان انگلستان رئیس کالج سلطنتی پزشکی بریتانیا 1992-1997 معاون اکادمی علوم پزشکی بریتانیا 1998 2004 ممانعت از دسترسی ساکنان اشرف به کمک های پزشکی به تاخیر انداختن عمدی معالجات حیاتی اجازه ندادن به ساکنان مجروح در هفتم ژانویه هفدهم دی برای بستری شدن اعمال جنایی و غیر انسانی هستند دولت عراق به خصوص نخست وزیر نوری المالکی مسئولیت کامل تمام این اعمال شرماور را بر عهده دارد این مسئولان باید توسط جامعه بین المللی به دست ادالت سپرده شوند لورد ترنبرگ مجلس اعیان لندن بیانیه وضعیت پزشکی در کمپش رف من درباره گزارشات مربوط به عدم کمک های پزشکی به ساکنان اشرف عمیقا نگرانم دولت عراق محدودیت هایی را بر کمپ اشرف اعمال کرده است ساکنان را از دسترسی آزاد به رسیدگی پزشکی من می کند که تمام میارهای به رسمیت شناخته شده را آشکارا نقض می کند و باید سریحا محکوم شود مقامات عراق در حالی که در علن ادعا می کنند خدمات پزشکی را برای ساکنان فراهم می کنند عملا بیمارستان را به یک سیاه چار شکنجه برای ساکنان تبدیل کردند مدیر بیمارستان به جای انجام یک کار هرفهی به دستور کمیته مسئول بستن اشرف در دفتر نخوص وزیر عراق به بیماران اهانت می کند آنها از فراهم کردن دارو و درمان برای بیماران خودداری می کنند. حتی در زمانی که یک بیمار از درد رنج می برد، حاضر نیستند به او چه زن باشد یا مرد داروی ضروری را بدهند. ممانعت از دسترسی به کمک های پزشکی به تاخیر انداختن عمدی معالجه به شدت مورد نیاز بیماران در حال مرگ اجازه ندادن به بیماران اورژانس بر اساس ملاحظات سیاسی چنانچه در مورد ساکنان زخمی و مجروح در هفتم ژانویه صورت گرفت اعمال جنایی و غیر انسانی هستند بسیار روشن است که دولت عراق در این رابطه حقوق ساکنان اشرف را به طور سیستماتیک نقض کرده است این محدودیت ها موجب افزایش در دورنج جسمی و روحی ساکنان اشرف شده است. یک بیمار در نتیجه تأخیر مداوم در معالجه جانش را از دست داده است. چندین نفر دیگر از نقص عضو دائمی رنج بردند و از جمله دچار معلولیت شدند. دولت عراق از دادن پاسخ به سوالات متعدد گزارشگران موضوعی سازمان ملل، از جمله گزارشگر ویژه در زمینه حق همگان در بهرهبندی از بالاترین استاندارد ممکن سلامت جسمی و روحی خودداری کرده است که این نماینده ویژه از عدم هر گونه پاسخ دولت به نامه‌هایش ابراز تأسف کرده است دولت عراق به خصوص نخست وزیر نوری المالکی مسئولیت کامل تمام این اعمال شرماور را بر عهده دارد این مسئولان باید توسط جامعه بین المللی به دست ادالت سپرده شوند. ساکنان اشرف بر اساس موقعیتشان به عنوان افراد حفاظت شده تحت کنوانسیون چهارم ژنو و مطابق با قانون حقوق بشر بین المللی حق دارند به امکانات دارویی و پزشکی دسترسی بدون محدودیت داشته باشند. محدودیت های اعمال شده توسط دولت عراق تعهداتش را تحت پیمان بین المللی حقوق مدنی و سیاسی که عراق آن را امضا کرده نقض می کند. 
من همچنین به شدت منزجر شدم که هنگامی که وزارت بهداشت عراق هیئتی را برای دیدار از اشرف فرستاد تا گزارشی را درباره خدمات و سرویس های پزشکی در اشرف تهیه کند نیروهای عراقی از گفتگو کردن آنها با ساکنان جلوگیری کردند بسیار روشن است که هدف دولت عراق مخفی کردن یا سفید سازی این جنایات است of the Academy of Medical Scientists has today issued a statement uh, concerning the denial of access to medical services at Camp Ashraf and he says here that uh, the, the uh, denying free access to medical services, deliberately delaying much needed treatment of terminally ill patients, refusing to admit emergency patients on the basis of political consideration as was the case with injured residents on the 7th of January this year, are criminal acts and inhumane. It is very clear that the Iraqi government is engaged in a systematic violations of the rights of residents in this respect. At Ashraf itself, a hospital built by residents, but now being run by Iraqis, must be one of the few in the world which is devoted entirely to denying medical treatment to those in need. In other words, you don't admit the patients you think you can treat and try to heal. You deliberately deny them that medical assistance in breach of all the conventions and human rights law. On the 7th of January, and this is the third time this has happened, Iranian agents and uniformed Iraqi thugs held rocks and bottles at residents, injuring 176 of them. Any of you have seen the videos, all they've got are the hands. Men and women got the hands and these thugs are swirling chains around and great thick planks of wood, throwing stones and bottles and all the rest of it. The hospital refused to treat any of the 176 for the cuts and damage to heads and limbs and the camp's own hospital did what it could to help. Access to consultants for people with serious medical conditions is regularly denied. Patients are prevented from seeking medical assistance in Baghdad and elsewhere. On the 8th of February, the hospital director referred, refused to allow medicine bought by patients into the camp. This is all part of the siege of Ashraf, and the Iraqis regularly deny entry for food, fuel, and other necessities, as well as visits by the family of residents. سمپوزیوم پارلمانی در بریتانیا کمپشرف و گذینه های سیاست در قبال ایران شورت ویدیو ویچ فیچرز مسیز مریم رجوی که از پریزیدنت الیکت از نشنل کانسل از رزیستنس از ایران مسیز رجوی هز لیترالی دیوتید هر لیف to the cause of helping the people of Iran to achieve the freedom and democracy which they want and are going to get. And in large measure, that will be because of Mrs. Rajivy. Mrs. Rajivy. Mr. President, Lord Corbett, ladies and gentlemen, I salute your gathering. I would like to first express my gratitude to the British Parliamentary Committee for Iran Freedom 
and the international parliamentary campaign in defense of Ashraf for initiating this conference. I would like to also commend members of the House of Commons for the valuable early day motion emphasizing the importance to safeguard Ashraf security and also the need to delist the PMOI from the U.S. list of terrorist organizations. Dear friends, three days ago, the Egyptian people's uprising succeeded. The dictatorship ruling that country fell. Before that, Tunisian people's uprising triumphed. We know that people in other parts of the region are also protesting. In fact, the spring of freedom has arrived in the Middle East. People are demanding democracy everywhere. Young people and women are the active forces of this movement. The wave of change in the region is to the detriment of the mullahs in Iran who are unable to deal with the explosive state of the Iranian society and they express their fear about the situation. The current developments revealed that the Western policy is lagging behind developments. They also proved the failure of the uh, premises that set the basis for the policy of appeasement. Appeasers denied popular urge for democracy in the region. They denied the importance of human rights for the region and sacrificed it for diplomatic and economic interests. The uprisings of the peoples of Tunisia and Egypt proved that these uh, premises and the policies that were based on them were totally wrong. For years, we criticized the West for joining the mullahs in suppression of the Iranian democratic resistance. Recent developments proved that our views and criticism were right. We truly wish success for our sisters and brothers in Tunisia and Egypt in establishing democracy and freedom in their countries. Therefore, addressing those who are worried about developments in the region, one should say, concentrate on the main threat, the Iranian regime. It's uh, therefore a mistake to ignore the threats of the religious fascism ruling Iran to the regional countries and overlook its destructive role in uh, diverting popular uprisings towards fundamentalism and extremism. Dear friends, many Western governments have acknowledged that the main threat to peace and stability is the Iranian regime. But this is not enough. The policy that paved the way for this regime must change. We cannot forget how far the British government went in appeasing the mullahs in Iran, paving its way and uh, obstructing the path for change in Iran by proscribing the PMOI. At that time, both houses of the British Parliament were crying out loud that the mullahs are behind the PMOI designation. Now, the WikiLeaks documents report of secret meetings by foreign office officials and officials from the US Embassy in London with agents from the Iranian regime's intelligence services to discuss the PMI. This was the flow of so-called uh, classified documents fabricated by the mullahs for 
both Foreign Office and the U.S. State Department. Dear friends, following uprisings in the region, change in policy vis-à-vis -vis Iran is even more crucial. Otherwise, the Iranian regime will disrupt the democratic trend in the region. Look at the situation in Iraq as an example. You can see how the mullahs profited the war and the U.S. policy of appeasement in order to penetrate that country's security, political and economic organs, and to dominate it. They tried to influence the elections in Iraq by resorting to terrorism, intimidation, and allocating a large sum of money for this purpose. After the elections, they have used all efforts to bring a favored government to power. Therefore, the disastrous consequences of the barriers the West has placed on the path of change in Iran is not limited to that country. Today, the entire region is suffering from the West's misguided policy toward Iran. This is why maintaining the PMI on the U.S. terrorist list is uh, 100 times more harmful today than before. In January, Mullahs executed 91 people, including prisoners affiliated to PMOI, whose crime were propaganda for PMOI and visit to Ashraf. In the meantime, Ashraf has been the target of repeated attacks. The attack of January 7 left 176 residents injured. Around the clock, psychological torture of the residents with 100 and 80 loudspeakers by mullahs, agents with the full support of the Iraqi Prime Minister has entered its second year. Uh, in absence of a decisive reaction by international community, the loudspeakers are now uh, blaring vile insults at women residents in Ashraf. This according to the international declaration of elimination of uh, violence against women is considered as a crime. In recent weeks, even entry of medicine for Ashraf residents that they had bought by their own resources under the supervision of Iraqi director of Ashraf's hospital has been blocked. How can one justify such a major crime against protected persons. It is time that the U.S. removes the terror label from the PMI and no longer hinders change in Iran and for the United Nations to set up a permanent monitoring team in Ashraf. I thank you all. There speaks the uh, strong voice of the Iranian resistance, and that's what makes the mullahs very wary about where they next put their foot. So with the Egyptian people on the one hand, and Mrs. Rajavi and her colleagues at Ashraf on the other, and our small voice, they haven't got a chance, have they? They've had it. First of all, I'd like to call on uh, Lord Carlisle of Beriu, who, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think he was the uh, government's independent reviewer of terrorism legislation.
from 2001 until just a few weeks ago. Alex. Can I start by um, echoing what has been said about Camp Ashraf and the situation there today? I think everybody here would join with me and with everyone, and Robin said this very eloquently, in passing our affection, our concern, and for me as a lawyer, our deep sense of injustice as to what the international community is allowing to occur at Camp Ashraf. And it's my view that the international community bears a very strong responsibility for this in its weakness in advocating that injustice. We should hear far more from the leading governments of the world. And all we are asking the United States government to do is what was eventually achieved here in the United Kingdom, albeit with attrition, and in Europe, which is to take the PMOI in the United States too into the family of recognized international institutions. What they're doing is completely illogical. Just think about it for a moment. If there is regime change in Iran, for example, as a result of a popular revolution, then there will have to be a government in its place. Wouldn't it be more sensible to be able to turn to a group of people about whom it can be said, we recognize these people as being responsible politicians without the ludicrous and inaccurate label that they happen to be terrorists too? Surely when there is regime change, the United States will need friends whom it has assisted towards the creation in due course of dem democratic institutions in Iran. But let me just remind you with a short direct quotation of what Lord Phillips of Wortham Travers, then uh, the sitting in the Court of Appeal, but now the President of the UK Supreme Court said. He said, it is a matter for comment and for regret that the decision-making process in this case has signally fallen short of the standards which our public law sets and which those affected by public decisions have come to expect. And he confirmed in that judgment that the Secretary of State for the time being's decision to refuse to deproscribe the PMOI was perverse, irrational, not reasonable, and not such that could have been founded on an honestly held belief by the Secretary of State. In the UK proceedings, the judgments of which are available publicly and of course in every detail to the United States government, every single allegation that could be trotted out against the PMOI was made, every one of those allegations was considered, and every single one of them that was material was demolished by the British courts. <laughs> Whilst I was in the United States, I pressed the United States government lawyers to tell me of a single piece of evidence that they had, beyond wild allegations made by the regime that cannot be corroborated any way, that was not rejected by the British courts in carefully reasoned judgments at two senior court levels. They were able to tell me of nothing. Now, I am a friend of the United States. I'm a lawyer in our common law jurisdiction and I admire their common law jurisdiction just as I think by and large they admire ours. But I do expect the United States, and I have said this to lawyers direct over there, to apply the same rigorous standards of judicial review of executive action to their State Department as were applied 
in the United Kingdom to our government. So far, they have failed to do so. What possible reason could they not have for doing so? Well, Lord Clark has used the right word, in my view, appeasement. For years, as you've heard, the British government, the United States government, have appeased the mullahs and Ahmadinejad because they have some kind of perverse belief that things will be better if they do not square up to them. But honestly, what is to be gained from not squaring up to them? What is the evidence that there is anything of advantage from not squaring up to them? What happens now with President Ahmadinejad is a sort of annual ritual. Some Western governments appease him and try to ensure that things happen that please the mullahs. And then he goes every year to the United States with his diplomatic immunity and makes a completely irrational ranting speech before the United Nations in which he repays the attention of the West by ridiculing them. I think it's time for that to stop, isn't it? And I think the clearest way in which the United States government can signal that it's time to stop is applying their Bill of Rights, their Constitution, in determining that the PMOI will now be a legal part of campaigning in the United States and free to make its case openly. Uh, Lord Alton is a, <coughs> excuse me, a former chief whip of the Liberal Party. He now sits as an independent uh, crossbench uh, life peer, and he's Professor of Citizenship at Liverpool John Moores University. He's been a friend of this campaign for more than 25 years. David. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Friends, it is nearly 30 years since, as a young member of the House of Commons, I organised a meeting for the NCRI at a party conference. And I think it was one of the very first meetings that the NCRI had ever had at a political conference. And I was deeply impressed then by, by, by what they had to say about the nature of the regime in Iran and how they offered a democratic alternative. And as the years have gone by, I've never equivocated about my support for the NCRI, and indeed with one of the signatories to the court case that Alex Carlyle has just talked about. And I said at the time, but it struck me as being the correct parallel to draw that if during the Second World War we'd tried to prescribe the French resistance, it would have been exactly the thing that we have done to the NCRI. Instead of standing alongside them, we have collaborated with the regime. And to echo what Tony Clark and Alex were saying before, we have indulged ourselves in appeasement. This is one of the great struggles for freedom. Many of us who are privileged to be here today, I suppose we almost take as our testament Nelson Mandela's great book, The Long March to Freedom. It has been, this has been a long march, a long walk to freedom. But we've lived through the fall of the, the Berlin Wall, as Robin said earlier on, and many of us would have wondered at the time if ever we'd, seen, we'd see those things come to pass. We've lived through the peace process in Northern Ireland and seen those rather different walls disappear. So we've seen fundamental change, and now we see these winds sweeping across North Africa and through the Middle East, and we can see change that is stirring in so many places. What I think this denotes is that when small stones move, landslides can happen. And that is what we are all part of. We are part of something that is bringing about a landslide of change, moving away from the kind of theocracy that allows women to be stoned to death, that permits public executions, that permits torture, that permits imprisonment of political dissenters 
and locks up people who come from religious minorities. I will always speak out for people to have the right to hold views with which I do not disagree or agree. It's irrelevant whether we agree or disagree. The right to free association, the right to free speech, the right to religious worship, the right to express political opinions, these are fundamental things which all of us must share with brothers and sisters elsewhere in the world, wherever they may be, and wherever we see those precepts being attacked. It is those things that the NCRI stands for. And how have we treated the NCRI? We've treated them first with the terror tag. We've treated them by accusing them of being a pernicious force out to undermine the precepts of our parliamentary democracies without a shred of evidence to back that up. And meanwhile, we have collaborated with the regime. And meanwhile, we have frequently shown indifference both to the sufferings which have been perpetrated by the regime, but as we're here gathered today to reflect upon the suffering of people who are currently held in Camp Ashraf. Just two weeks ago, Robin raised that question in the House and I contributed a supplementary question to it. And I agree with what was being said before about the Minister of State in the Foreign Office, Lord Howell of Guildford. I thought that at last we had an attentive ear, that we had someone who was willing to enter into the suffering that has been taking place in Ashraf. And I gave him subsequently documents from lawyers in Madrid who have themselves been able to take this case into the Spanish courts. And I simply asked the question, why it is possible in Spain, which is after all, as we are too, a member of NATO, but also a member of the European Union, if it is possible to take a court like this, where a country is manifestly in dereliction of its duties underneath the, um, under the Geneva Convention, if it's possible to take Iraqi officials through the courts in Spain, why is it not possible for us to do the same here as well? It is an undisputed fact that the current regime in Iran is not serious in negotiation. It has no intention of changing its behavior, and indeed it's incapable of reform because it would lead to its collapse. After years of experience, and in particular the failure of the Istanbul talks, no one can deny this unless they are supporters of the regime in Iran. In my view, having known the National Council for Resistance over these last 30 years. I believe they're not only the driving force for democratic change in Iran, but given the current turmoil in the region and the Iran Iranian regime's attempts to divert the course of people's movement for democracy to an authoritarian regime, we've seen the terrible repression of demonstrations in the country. The PMI is an antithesis to that fundamentalist regime in Iran. Having known the movement so long, I'm also fully aware of all the criticisms and the allegations which are raised against them. At times, we've all on this platform been bombarded by that kind of disinformation, the original source of which, of course, is the Iranian Ministry of Intelligence. However, the disturbing part for me has been that the Foreign Office would also rely in the past on the same information to justify the unjust positions that we have heard today in trying to discourage members of Parliament and peers from supporting the PMOI. One of the usual hearsays that is disseminated is that the P PMOI doesn't have any support in Iran. Well, friends, I would say let's get rid of this regime and let the people of Iran decide for that. PMOR, I am asking no more than that. So let's be clear, whether it's here in the United Kingdom, whether it's within the European Union, or whether it's to our friends in the United States, failure to act endangers lives. Failure to act represents moral cowardice. Failure to act makes us complicit. Collaboration and appeasement never pay. It was Albert Einstein who said, the world is a dangerous place, not because of evil people, but because of the good people who do nothing about it. It's our duty to do something about it.
I can't tell you what a rare treat this is. The former Speaker of the House of Commons. Ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by paying tribute to our friend and chairman, Lord Robin Corbett, for his commitment and his dedication to the cause of a democratic Iran and human rights for its people. We are very fortunate, you know, to have Robin's leadership here in London and in Parliament, and I commend him. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for many years the Iranian regime has been the world's most infamous abuser of human rights. Already we've heard in the early part of this year more than 90 people have been executed. The lives of innocent people are being put at risk and human life is being ruthlessly violated. And when we analyze the individuals who were targeted, we find them to be those of the Iranian opposition movement and members and relatives of the PMOI based at Camp Ashraf. In the eyes of the regime, the crime of those executed and attacked is their determination to seek the basic freedoms of democracy, freedom of speech, and freedom of association. They are the simple demands of the Iranian people who in the last 18 months have protested in Iran's towns and cities, and these are the values that Camp Ashraf residents proclaim, and we stand with them in their demands. My friends, what is happening at Ashraf is unacceptable. The Iraqi authorities have directly attacked residents. Some have been murdered, some have been injured, others have been illegally detained and tortured. Sick patients have been denied hospitalization and medical practitioners have been denied access to the sick. The constant use of loudspeakers threatening to kill amounts to psychological torture. You know, it's good to see so many young people here today. Not as mature as I am, but many of you will recall as I do that when we were very young, but we were old enough to be aware of the grim realities of harassment and persecution, intimidating and murder perpetrated on the continent of Europe by the Nazi regime, who sought to destroy people simply because they did not like them. It, it, ha it has to stop. Frequently, of course, fine words come from Western leaders. But words aren't enough. All countries and institutions that uphold civilized values must press upon Iraq to cease its torturous warfare against Ashraf. Um, I don't know whether you've heard during the course of this afternoon, I'm sure you have, that of the parliamentary exchange between Lord Corbett and the Minister for Foreign Affairs in the uh, House of Lords. But he did say in those parliamentary exchanges that the United Kingdom government was planning another meeting with Iraqi officials. And there's no doubt that Robin and those of us who can will put all pressure, we must continue to keep pressure on this issue of the meeting between UK officials and the Iraqis in talks about Ashraf. Uh, we, are, we were also told, those of us who were not aware in the Lords, by Lord Ashcroft, Lord Ashton, Alton, of the, uh, the early next month, of course, the uh, the Spanish courts will have before them some of the officials of the Iraqi government charging them with violations of human rights at Camp Ashraf. And I think we must be alert to what will take place in Spain and watch carefully to see whether other member states of the European Union can take a similar position as the Spanish authorities and why not. My friends, I came here today not only to see you, 
but to give a message to the people of Iran. And as we are nearing International Women's Day, I single out the female population inside and outside Camp Ashraf. I speak directly to them and I say to them, I was born of a poor family and humble background. Of course, in my country, we didn't have the infamous regime to tackle as you have. But those like me were able to flourish because our forebears fought for a society where democracy, equality, the rule of law and freedom from fear became paramount. And we now rejoice in that. You in your country will not have experienced one iota of that degree of freedom. But have no doubt, you will do so as will your children and as will your grandchildren. Continue your courageous fight. You, you are playing an integral role in protesting against the horrendous regime. We in this country and throughout the world know of your activities and I salute your great courage and determination in the face of organized aggression by hired mobs and by Iraqi forces. With Mrs. Rajivi leading your people and your parliament in exile, you and your menfolk can change your nation. And for our part, we will do what we can to support you as the real and viable means of, democratic, of bringing democratic change to Iran. My best wishes to you all. Thank you.